IoT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric. With a booming world population comes a growing need for food and drink. But as our needs grow, so do our demands. We want more choice. Is it organic? Where does it come from? To satisfy so many demands, the food and beverage industry is turning to the digital world. In this programme, we'll go to Sweden to find out how the world's largest food packaging company is doing more than producing just containers. We'll learn how a disruptor company is helping commercial kitchens reduce the amount of food they waste. And we'll talk to an expert about the regulatory issues affecting food and beverage companies in the B2B sector. And we'll find out what changes digital technology will bring to food and beverage companies in the future. Tetra Pak was founded in 1951, but it grew out of a company established in 1929. It's evolved from its food carton origins to become a tech partner, helping household brands improve the efficiency of their production lines. It's still a privately owned company, and its headquarters is still here in Lund in Sweden. Johan Nielsen is the vice president of Tetra Pak Services. He joined Tetra Pak in 1987 as a trainee service engineer. So he's seen a lot of transformation in the company. I asked Johan about Tetra Pak's business model and who its B2B customers are. We have around uh, 5,000 customers or a bit more than 5,000 customers in 170 countries around the world. This is large liquid food manufacturers, dairy companies and other things such as Nestlé, all over the world, uh, Yili in China, Meiji in Japan, we have Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, uh, Pepsi and these type of companies. Uh, and we provide um, the material, you know, the, car the laminated carton material, closures, the straws, etc., to make a juice or a milk carton. We produce the, all, the, all the equipment related to processing the milk and the juice, etc., and to package it and to put it into containers onto a pallet ready for retailers. And then we provide a large portfolio of services to make this an efficient operation for our customers. One of the services Tetra Pak offers its customers is predictive maintenance. Predictive maintenance works in a way that you have sensors in equipment. It can be vibration sensors, temperature sensors, torque sensors. Then you use that information. So we take around 600 signals from a typical production line. We collect them through the cloud to a data center we have. And then through algorithms, you calculate remainable use of a lifetime. So you see how vibration increases. And then you know that when vibration in combination with a certain temperature reaches certain limits, you know that there is just a short lifetime left. That way you can predict when a failure will happen with a high degree of certainty. Because it's machine learning and with some of the deep learning technologies, these algorithms improves all the time. So you get more precise and you tell the customer, in four weeks, you are likely to have this failure. Can we please come in two weeks and make sure that we change this part so it will not break? We had an example with a customer in Argentina where customs in Argentina is quite complicated. You know, it can take up to 96 hours to import a part that is needed. If you can predict the need of that part a few weeks in advance, those 96 hours doesn't matter. But if you can't predict the need, those 96 hours will cause big losses to food manufacturing. And if you have 50,000 liters of milk in a tank, that will not last for 96 hours if, if that piece of equipment or that production line cannot run. You're in many countries mm -hmm. around the world, but your experts aren't. So how has digital technology helped you there? Uh, there, one of the areas is mixed reality and how you can connect people. So we use HoloLens, for example, to connect an expert that we might have somewhere in a center, in a technical center, to anywhere in the world through a Skype or similar type of technologies. That, that makes the expert being virtually present on the factory floor within minutes. 
So the guy that is in the remote location, he puts on the HoloLens. So the guy that sits with a tablet or a phone, he sees exactly what the, the local guy sees. They can talk and he can draw and he can pull up instructions, he can pull up a lot of things and different types of information that helps the guy that is on site to solve the problem very quickly. We use that in many different parts of the world today and that adds a lot of value because it's instant support. You can imagine the time it takes to fly someone from one place to another. There is sometimes uh, visa requirements that makes it takes uh, weeks to get and these type of things. There is other type of applications. So imagine that you're going to build a new factory and you have this big empty room and you want to see where am I going to place my machines and can I place them in a way so I can open all the doors and these things so it can work in practice. What you do then, you put on a set of HoloLens, you walk around in this big empty factory. So you basically place these virtual machines in the factory and then you just check that everything works. And then when you have that, you get your drawing, you order everything so it fits perfectly. You avoid these type of problems that there was a wall that you didn't think was there when you check the drawing. How do you measure the results of the tech that you've incorporated? Less failures, you know, less consumer complaints on a product, for example, can be an outcome. Financial savings, you know, efficiency improvements, bottom line improvements of our customers and so. The payback for our customers is typically months and not years on these type of investment because the technology you add is not very costly and the savings can be huge. What partnerships have you entered into though in the digital technology sphere to get these services going? We try to partner with a lot of the leaders in digital technology. So Microsoft is one big partner for us, of course. We sometimes make some partnerships with these startup companies of three, four guys, you know, who has a brilliant idea in a very specific field. And we make a deal with them a little bit that we buy a certain amount of their capacity and then they help us work with solutions in the mixed reality world, for example. Tetra Pak is a long established company. In fact, this is the prototype of the machine used to make the first ever one of these tetrahedron packs in 1952. I'm off now to a new company using digital technology to help its customers tackle food waste. Winnow is a UK startup launched in 2013. It already has more than 600 clients using its smart kitchen tech. This is its London HQ in a building shared with other companies in the sustainability business. Mark Zorns is co-founder and CEO of Winnow. He'd previously worked at McKinsey on food and sustainability. He told me why he'd launched Winnow. Roughly a trillion dollars a year of food is thrown away. That is over one and a half percent of global GDP. And it's about a third of all food that is actually grown that is never eaten. And to me, that's just shocking that we would live in a society where we allow that to happen. And it's almost a foregone conclusion to me that over the next 20 to 30 years, we're gonna have to fix this issue, right? And so while I was at McKinsey, we were doing some analysis that actually surfaced this issue as a problem. And because I had a background in food my entire life, working in different parts of the food supply chain, um, and a passion for where business and sustainability met to create interesting opportunities, um, I decided, and I really felt compelled at that point in time, to go build Winnow to actually be part of solving this issue. You're harnessing digital technology Tell me how you do it. The way Winnow works is um, effectively in commercial kitchens. Um, it's very difficult to understand what's being wasted, where it's happening, and why. These are busy operations. They're very complex operations. And what Winnow does is we provide a data platform for the kitchen on what they're wasting to inform the chef on how they can run an operation better. And there's an old tenet that what gets measured gets managed. Are you saying that what's disruptive about the tech you use is that it's changing behavior? What's disruptive about the tech that we use is we're providing data in a place where data didn't exist. And we're trying to provide that information in a way that will drive action. Mark showed me how Winnow works. This is what Winnow is. It's a 
scale that sits underneath the bin to automatically record that food waste and a tablet that would sit next to it to help you identify what it was and collect the costs of what's being wasted. Okay, let's have a go. So if you, if you would imagine that you were throwing away some oranges like this, right? So you okay. throw some oranges away just like that. The screen will pop up and let's say that it was from breakfast. So okay. you would tap that. That's right, it was fruits. Um, and then you select the item from there. Citrus fruit. Right, so that's two pounds 61. But over a year, that's 953 pounds. That's a lot of money. Yeah, and just imagine sort of how often that will happen throughout a day in the kitchen and what that adds up to. And then you would just simply throw away the next item. So let's say these On were top. some carrots from the salad bar. Yep. Let's say that it was from the core areas, right? And carrots just carrots. like that. 21 pence. 77 pounds a year. Yep. And there are sites we work with that start off throwing away literally thousands of pounds worth of food on a weekly basis. What then happens is all that information goes up into the cloud, gets analyzed to identify trends, and then we provide analytics into the chef and into an operation that may have multiple sites to be able to help them figure out where they can improve performance. What they're doing with that information really varies. It is everything from very simple bits such as, are we going to redesign our offer? to be able to systemically prevent the food waste from being occurred. It can also be being more thoughtful around how much gets prepared at any given time so that they're not left over with food at the end. It can also be benchmarking performance across sites and seeing that this site is only throwing away 3% of what they're buying, but this site's throwing away 10. And fundamentally, those are very similar businesses. So why is that? And let's make sure that we learn from best practice. Who are your B2B customers? So we're really proud to be working with some of the industry leaders in a number of key parts of the hospitality sector. So we work with Compass Group, the world's largest food service company. We work in the hotel space with companies like Accor Hotels. Uh, we work in quick service with IKEA. And most recently, we've begun to make headway into the cruise line industry with the Italian division of Carnival Cruise Lines, which is Costa Crociere. How effective is it in doing the job? So we find that when we put window into kitchens and they implement our system to understand what's being wasted and take action on that, that ultimately they can cut food waste in half within their business. And what that means for an operation typically means a three to an eight percent food cost savings um, with a lot of that flowing down to their bottom line. But kitchens are very busy places. How does staff find the time to use Winnow? We focus our system on being dead simple to use. It takes only a few minutes a day for a kitchen staff to use the system. If you then think about the time that they are saving to not prepare that food that would have otherwise been wasted, ultimately in the end, we're actually making these kitchens easier to run. We're actually saving that time in the kitchen as a result. B2B companies in the food and beverage sector are harnessing digital technology to help increase efficiency, profitability and sustainability. But wherever food and drink is concerned, strict regulations are in place. We'll find out more in part two. The complexity of the food and beverage supply chain creates big challenges for companies operating in the sector and for the regulators. Digitalisation looks set to help businesses navigate the increasingly stringent regulatory regime. Mike Jamieson is segment president of food and beverage at Schneider Electric and an expert on the food and beverage industry. If you look within food and beverage, the main regulations that affect it, there's really primarily two that are affecting it you know, within the US and, and Europe. That you have the EU, the General Food and Safety Act, and in the, the US you have the, the Food Modernization Act as well. Um, the US one is focused more on prevention, uh, the, the European one is focused more on just general food safety. But both of them are based off of HACCP, you know, hazard analysis and critical control points. What are the main regulations which Tetra Pak must comply with? There is some regulations in the food and beverage industries related to food safety, of course. We always try to be in the forefront of those. We are well connected with the FDA and so, so we always try to be in the forefront on the technologies we develop, and especially process control of how do you secure that these manufacturing processes that produce a septic product are stable and they always stay in condition and so. So we try to work very tightly with these authorities that set legislations around food and beverage. But there are other challenges facing the food and beverage sector. 
So if you look at food and bev companies, they buy materials from suppliers, they buy raw materials. So it's been able to trace upstream to see where did these materials come from? Uh, did they come from indeed where you s thought you were sourcing them from? Uh, if you look downstream as well, it's been able to trace it all the way to the consumer as well, because there may be many steps in distribution between leaving the manufacturing plant and actually getting to the consumer. And the food can become contaminated by things like logistics, uh, by lack of cooling. Suddenly the product can go off before it reaches the consumer. Uh, so the, the manufacturer on B2B, he really has to be in control of his complete supply chain because at the end of the day, it's his brand, it's his brand equity that's affected if when it's on the shelf, it has a problem. That goes the same to the materials used in the packages, for example. There is FSC labeling, you know, Forest Stewardship Council labeling, that um, the, the material used in, in the packages comes from forestry, where you plant more trees than you take out, for example, and these things. You've got to guarantee uh, that what you're producing is indeed what it says on the label. Uh, that it's free from allergens, that you're, you're sustainable sourcing. You've got to start to have this transparency within your supply chain. So digitization is the way to enable that. So companies can't wait 15 years. It's a demand today, now we need to start to prove it within the supply chain digitally. Mark Zorns at Winnow says regulation around food waste is evolving quickly. Start with a bunch of countries that have targets to reduce food waste. So in the EU, there's a target by 2030 to reduce food waste by 50%. You've also got countries like Australia and the US adopting the same. Um, what we are also starting to see is in areas like France, they are beginning to ban food waste from being thrown away in supermarkets. In other words, if there was food that could have been eaten, it would be illegal to throw that away and you are compelled to donate that, okay? On the other side, you know, we have a client, um, Costa Cruises, who has food left over at the end of day, that they've already reduced it down as much as they can, but they would like to give that away. However, the regulatory environment in many of the countries they operate in is challenging to be able to do that because it's unclear if they have some responsibility for that food. And so what Cost has been doing is they've been working, for example, with the Italian regulators to develop a law to help them to donate food waste in a way that both takes in the best interest of the recipient of that food, but also allows the organization to feel like that's a risk that they're willing to take to be able to make those donations. How does Mark think regulations around food waste could change yet more? What I do see is a potential where customers, or excuse me, um, kitchens and organizations would be required to report how much food waste they're generating and what they're doing to address that problem. And in that place, frankly, I think that'd be a win-win. We have proven a number of times that monitoring what you measure and preventing it drives a cost savings to the business, drives an environmental benefit and drives a societal benefit. So if we really are serious in the world about cutting food waste in half, uh, measurement's gonna have to become something that everybody does. In the future, digital tech will be instrumental in helping regulators maintain standards across the food and beverage industry. But what other changes will digital innovation bring to the sector in years to come? We'll find out in part three. As the world's population continues to grow and as consumers become ever more demanding, B2B companies in the food and beverage sector need to keep looking for new solutions. There'll be new demands on food packaging companies like TetraPak. We still have a growing population in the world. We still have a lot of unpacked product, you know, milk that is sold loose and these type of things with a lot of risks to food safety and, and so. And uh, as the economy grows in many countries, and uh, modern retail moves into more and more countries and so, the, the desire to have packaged food is increasing among consumers. A food package such as a milk package or a juice package will in the future, of course, be a lot smarter than what it is today. It will be a unit of one. It will have a digital identity, these packages. So how you can communicate with that package in terms of information, you can scan it with an iPhone or something. You can get a lot of information of the origin of the product. You might get a lot of other things. I believe in a future where there will be um, other type of digital, digitalized components on a package. Uh, you know, digital inks, for example, that will change with temperature, so you can check what temperature a milk package has been in. 
has it been out of the refrigerator too long or something and these type of informations will be on the package in the future. Then you have of course the things that put very specific demands on the packages itself is when you go to modern retail stores or other type of retail stores in the future like the ones Amazon experiment with now where you have no checkout. You go in, you pick your packs, artificial intelligence sees what you pick, you just walk out and your credit card is charged of course. Then you know the packs must be identifiable by um, few digital technologies and that can be radio signals or it can be QR codes or whatever or it's the placement where they are and these type of things. So how systems communicate with packages becomes very important in that type of future. Food fashion has already had an impact on what you do. You, you've got mm -hmm. uh, nut milks and vegan milks, all, mm -hmm. all, all those kinds of things. How do you see those food fads affecting the way you do business in the future? There was a time when milk was milk. Today milk is not milk. Milk is many different things, as you said, of course. And it gets more individualised. And that, that adds a lot of complexity in production. The way you drove efficiency in all types of manufacturing is historically was of course I make the batches longer and longer and longer. I don't want stops, changeovers and these things. But with the increase of uh, variety in assortment you have to use these technologies so that the batch changes becomes almost invisible. So you have flying changes of these type of things. And also how you pack things etc. That's where technologies such as robotics and handling of information along the production value chain. Sustainability within the food and beverage, in, beverage industry will continue to be a, a major, major factor and, and digitization is only going to enhance it and support it. Uh, using sustainability, so when you produce the product, how do you make sure you use less resources, less water, less energy, less electricity? less waste. The population is growing fantastically, there's a shortage of farmland, there's a shortage of water. So to meet this uh, rising demand that comes from the increase in population, we have to reduce waste streams uh, right down to the consumer. Does that mean Winnow's technology will have a place in domestic kitchens? I absolutely do see there to be value in finding a way to help homes measure food waste. We actually did a trial with the UK supermarket Sainsbury's where we put Winnow in its large kitchen form into a number of homes and cut food waste by 70%, saving homes hundreds of dollars a year. There is a tremendous opportunity to help homes reduce food waste. What digital tech do you think we'll be using in this space in 20 years time? Wow, 20 years is, is, is a long way out. Um, I mean, I kind of liken where we are with food waste in how we used to think about energy efficiency, meaning that we should turn off the lights when we leave a room. And now we have motion sensors when we walk in that turn that off. We have energy monitoring across the whole building. So I imagine a smart kitchen of the future where perhaps there are robotic chefs that are cooking your food and um, all sorts of artificial intelligence figuring out kind of what should happen. And what I also see is I see a wave of investment coming in from venture capital to say, actually kitchens and um, the home and smart homes is an incredibly interesting space to invest in. And so I think that investment as it matures will really impact our daily lives in a very fundamental way. If I think about the sci-fi programs when I was a kid, we weren't eating proper food. It was all, you know, vacuum packed space dust and things like that. And man, that would be that would be depressing if 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 food in the future is either vacuum packed or some sort of slimy goo that we're all eating for nutrition, right? Um, I really hope that a sustainable food future is one that's delicious, right? One that is about something that we can enjoy that is enriching and that brings us together as a community. And while technology will drive a lot of change, that social bond is something that's been there for millennia. And I don't think it's something that's gonna change. The digital transformation in the food and beverage sector is gaining momentum. In an industry with complex supply chains, businesses are using innovative digital technology to increase efficiency, sustainability and traceability. And fast changing ideas and appetites around food mean that this digital revolution is only just beginning.
IoT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric.